In this section, we're going to be going over antiderivatives. So up to this point, we should be familiar with taking derivatives of a function or differentiation. Now what we're going to be doing is essentially going in the reverse direction, which is going to be finding the antiderivative of a function. So it's kind of, if you want to think of it like this before we get into the definition of it, if you have some function and you have its derivative, f prime of x, going from the function to its derivative is obviously taking the derivative or differentiation. And if we start with the derivative and go back to the original, that's called anti-differentiation. So basically what we're going to have to do is work backwards. We're not really going to be thinking of it as starting with the derivative though and going back to the original. We're going to be thinking of it as starting with a function and then going back to the antiderivative of the function. But if you think about it like this, that's kind of an easy, uh, an easy way to think about it here. Okay, so let's get to a definition. And don't let the notation here confuse you. Uh, definition, a function f is going to be called an antiderivative of f. If f, capital F prime of x equals little f of x for all of x in the interval. Okay, so what we're going to be doing is we are going to be starting with a function. We're going to be starting with a function little f. And then we're going to be taking the antiderivative of it and getting capital F. So it's the same concept, what we mentioned right up here, except we're just changing the notation a little bit, just because technically we're not going to be starting with something called f prime. We're just going to say we're starting with little f. Okay, so basically we're going to be using the capital letters to denote the antiderivative for this uh, section here. So let's go ahead and see what we kind of mean by this antiderivative. So let's say we have this function, 3x to the fourth. We know the derivative, using power rule, of this function is 12x cubed, right? So the derivative of 3x to the fourth is 12x cubed. So does that mean if we work backwards, does it mean that 3x to the fourth is the antiderivative of 12x cubed, right? So just working in the reverse order here. So the answer to that question is yes, that is one antiderivative, but there's actually others. So this is why this gets maybe just a little bit trickier than taking the derivative, because technically there's not only one antiderivative. So let's see what we mean by that. So let's say we want to take the derivative of 3x to the fourth plus 1. 3x to the fourth plus 1 taking the derivative, we get 12x cubed, right? Because the derivative of 1 is 0. And now let's say we want to take the derivative of 3x to the fourth minus 873. Taking the derivative of that, we still get 12x cubed because the derivative of 873 is 0. So in general, if we're taking the derivative of 3x to the fourth plus c, where c is any constant. So c can be 1, c can be negative 873, c can be 10 billion, c could be pi. No matter what, if we take the derivative of a constant, we get 0. So the derivative of 3x to the fourth plus c is going to equal 12x cubed. So what these questions are going to be asking are going to be typically what's the general antiderivative of, of a function. So if we're taking the general antiderivative of 12x cubed, we don't only get 3x to the fourth, we get 3x to the fourth plus any constant. So that's pretty much always going to be happening for these types of questions. We're always going to have this plus c at the end because when we take the derivative of c, we get zero. Okay, so that just kind of brings us to this general theorem here. If f is the antiderivative of little f, then the most general antiderivative, so I'm going to go ahead and highlight most general and leave that highlighted, is going to be the antiderivative plus c, where c is an arbitrary constant. 
arbitrary meaning it could be essentially any constant. So let's see some examples. So these examples, we're just going to think backwards, which is essentially how we're going to do this for the most part. But on the next page, we're going to see a nice table that we should have memorized. So let's find the most general antiderivative of each of the following functions. So most general, we know we're going to have a plus c. So we want the antiderivative of f of x equals sine of x. So we should be saying to ourselves, when we take the derivative of what, when is, what will give us uh, sine of x? So we should know that the derivative of cosine equals negative sine of x. So the derivative of cosine is negative sine of x. That means the antiderivative of sine of x needs to be negative cosine of x. And then once again, plus c, we should always have that arbitrary constant when we're taking an antiderivative. So let's go ahead and check these ones on this page for now. So if we would take the derivative now, if we go the other way, if we take the derivative of negative cosine x plus c, we should make sure that we end up getting sine of x. So the derivative of negative cosine is going to be negative negative sine of x. The derivative of a constant is zero, so we end up getting negative and negative cancel off, positive sine of x. So it checks out and we are good. So you can see how we are just essentially working backwards here. Okay, next one we have h of x equals 1 over x. So we're trying to find the antiderivative, which once again we're going to say the antiderivative is just the capital H of x. So we're saying if we take the derivative of what, what will give us 1 over x? So we have to think, okay, well we have to remember the derivative of ln of x is 1 over x. The one tricky thing here is when we're doing it this way, we need the absolute value bars here because 1 over x, the domain of that is everything except for 0, but the domain of ln of x is only positive numbers. So technically, we could have negative numbers for our first function. We cannot have negative numbers for the antiderivative. So putting the absolute value bars make sure that it will be positive input. And then as usual, antiderivative, make sure you have a plus c. Okay, so we go ahead and we check. This is, checking is always a good idea because you can just make sure you got it right. We we're gonna take the derivative of the ln of the absolute value of x plus c. The derivative of the ln of x is one over x. The derivative of plus c is zero. So we get 1 over x, which is what we started with, so we know we did it right. Okay, next one, which is a little bit trickier, g of x equals x plus 2. So we need to find the antiderivative capital G. So we need to think, when we take the derivative of something and we get x, we have to think about what that is. So we're going to see the general formula for this in a second. I'm just going to tell you what the answer is for now. 1 half x squared. If we take the derivative of 1 half x squared using power rule, that gives us x. And we can do this one separately, plus 2. What, when we take the derivative of what, what will give us 2? And I'm going to tell you that's going to be 2x. And then we need our plus c. So this is our most general antiderivative. So remember, most general plus c. We could have that plus c be plus 7, and that would be a antiderivative but not the most general. Let's go ahead and check this. So when we check the derivative of 1 half x squared plus 2x plus c, the derivative using power rule is going to be 1 half times 2x, the 1 half times 2 cancels, and now the derivative of 2x is just 2. The derivative of c is 0, so we get x plus 2, so we know that we did it correctly. Okay, so that brings us to this table of anti-differentiation formulas. 
So these are technically things that we should memorize, uh, but you can always figure it out by just working backwards. So here we have, we're going to be starting with some function, and then we're going to be taking the antiderivative of it. And just notice it says particular answer, antiderivative, not general, so there's no plus c's here, just so it doesn't get too crowded. So let's go through and run through all of these. So if we start with a constant times a function, the antiderivative is just going to be the constant times whatever the antiderivative is of that function. So all this means is that the constant out front won't change anything, it just comes along for the ride. Next one, if we have two different functions and we're taking the antiderivative where they're being added or it could be subtracted as well, then all we have to do is we do them separately. We do the antiderivative of the first one plus the antiderivative of the second one. Okay, so hopefully those ones are kind of easy enough. The next one is essentially the reverse power rule. So if you start with something x to the n, so that could be you know, x squared, x cubed, x to the negative 4, uh, x to the negative 3 fifths, whatever it happens to be. It's just x to the n, where n is not equal to 1. If n, or n, was, n is not equal to negative 1, if n is equal to negative 1, that would be x to the negative 1, which is 1 over x, which is the next one. So x to the n, reverse power rule, if we're taking the antiderivative of that, what we have to do is add 1 to the exponent and then divide by that new exponent. So this is reverse power rule. Make sure you know this. It is very, very important. Obviously, we need this rule when we're taking the antiderivative of polynomials. Okay, uh, and then one other thing with this one. If we're doing the antiderivative of a constant, like let's go ahead and say we're doing the antiderivative of some constant c, we could actually force this to have a variable, right? We could say c would equal c to the x, c x to the 0, because x to the 0 equals 1. So this would end up being using this rule, c x, you add 1 to the exponent, divide by that new exponent, so the antiderivative becomes the constant times x. So anytime, anytime you're doing the antiderivative of a constant, the antiderivative of a constant is going to be just multiplying it by x. Okay, so that's essentially the reverse power rule, but you shouldn't actually go through and do that work. You should just skip right to multiplying it by x. Okay, next one. If you're taking the antiderivative of 1 over x, we get the ln of the absolute value of x. Once again, make sure you have the absolute value bars. That's because the derivative of ln of x is 1 over x. Next, for the easy one, the antiderivative of e to the x is itself because the derivative of e to the x is itself. Next one, the derivative of b to the x, where b can be any base here, like 2 to the x, is going to be b to the x over the ln of b. So if we take the antiderivative of 2 to the x, that would be 2 to the x over the ln of 2. Next one, the antiderivative of cosine is sine, because the derivative of sine is cosine. Antiderivative of sine is negative cosine, so that one you just have to be a little bit careful with. The antiderivative of secant squared is tangent, because the derivative of tangent is secant squared. Antiderivative of secant of x times tangent of x is secant of x. And then we have these ones a little bit more complicated with the inverse functions. Uh, we have the antiderivative of 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared is sine inverse. And the antiderivative of 1 over 1 plus x squared is tangent inverse. And there's other ones here, but these are the ones that we're going to see um, most often. So let's go ahead and see some examples. Find the most general antiderivative of each of the following functions. This time we're going to use our rules. So let's find the antiderivative. Going to use the uppercase f of x here. So technically both of these are reverse power rule. So we're going to add 1 to the exponent. That exponent's a 1, so we add 1, we get 2. We divide by that new exponent. 
Next, we have minus 7. So remember that we're doing the antiderivative of a constant. We're just going to multiply it by x. And then most general antiderivative, we always need plus c. Okay, and then once again, if, if you were taking a quiz or an exam or something, I recommend checking your answer. Take the derivative of this. Make sure you end up with what you started with. So easy enough, right, once you know the... Uh, little formulas you need to be using. It's the same difficulty essentially as taking the derivative, just the reverse direction. Next one, we have f of x equals 7 x to the 2 fifths plus 3 x to the over x to the 4th minus 5 e to the x. Let's go ahead and rewrite this first. I'm going to rewrite this as 3 x to the negative 4 for that second term. So now when we're taking the antiderivative here, capital F of x, the antiderivative, we can see that the first one is the reverse power rule. So it's going to be 7x. We need to add one and then divide by the new exponent. So adding 1 to 2 fifths, we have to add fractions. That's 2 fifths plus 5 fifths. That's going to give us 7 fifths. Now we have to divide by that new fraction. So technically, I recommend skipping this step and going down to the next one that I'll write. So just hold off for a second for that. So next one, we need to add 1 to the exponent. So adding 1 to negative 4 is negative 3. Divide by the new exponent. Always be careful when we're adding with the negatives. And then negative 5 e to the x, the antiderivative of that is itself, right? Constants don't change anything. Antiderivative of e to the x is e to the x. We put a plus c. Let's clean this up a little bit. So I recommend when we are dividing by a fraction, instead of dividing by 7 fifths, you should skip right to multiplying by the reciprocal. So instead of dividing by 7 fifths, you should multiply by 5 sevenths. So now you could see that the sevens will cancel, and you're going to be left with 5x to the 7 fifths. So I recommend, instead of writing this step, I recommend multiplying it by 5 over 7. Okay, next term, we can see the 3's cancel off, and we end up with minus 3x to the negative 3, then minus 5e to the x plus c, and then we're done. Okay, and then last example here, we have f of x equals 6x cubed minus radical 2 over x plus 1. So this denominator, or th this second term here, typically you might want to check if you can rewrite it to make it easier on yourself. Don't rewrite this second term. Don't rewrite this as negative radical 2x to the negative 1. Anytime you have an x in the denominator and you're finding the antiderivative, leave it alone because that means it's going to be, the antiderivative is going to be the ln of x. Okay, so let's go ahead and do this one. So taking the antiderivative, we get capital F of x. And the antiderivative of the first one, that's going to be that reverse power rule again. So 6x add 1 to the exponent, divide by that new exponent, minus. So this right here, if you really wanted to rewrite that, you could rewrite that as minus radical 2 times 1 over x. So that makes it maybe a little bit more obvious that that's going to be minus radical 2 times the ln of the absolute value of x. So remember, radical 2 is a constant. That's just coming along for the ride. And then plus 1, the antiderivative of 1 is going to be 1 times x. Obviously, you don't write 1 times x. You just write x. And then we have plus c. Okay, and then we can clean this up just a little bit. Three or uh, the, For the first term, 6 over 4. We can just rewrite that as 3 over 2 and then x to the fourth minus radical 2 times the ln of the absolute value of x plus x plus some arbitrary constant c. Okay, as usual, take the derivative of this function to make sure 
it is the same as the function that we started with. Okay, next example, we want to find all functions g such that g prime of x equals 4 sine of x plus 2x to the fifth minus radical x over x. So this is just a different way of saying find the antiderivative of this function, right? So before we were given a function, say g of x, and we were finding the antiderivative, calling it capital G of x. Now we're just renaming it and saying we're starting with g prime and we're finding g. So same exact concept. So before we do anything, let's go ahead and rewrite this. The reason is we should rewrite that second term. Anytime you have a single, a single term in the denominator, it might be beneficial to split it up, meaning give each term in the numerator its own denominator, and it might simplify. In this case, it does simplify. 2x to the fifth over x, that gives us 2x to the fourth. Radical x over x, this would be uh, you're dividing similar bases. That's x to the one half divided by x to the first. So you have to subtract the exponents. That gives us x to the negative one half. One half minus one is x to the negative one half. Okay, so all we did was a little algebra so far. We just rewrote it. Now let's go ahead and find the antiderivative, which is g of x, little g of x here. So let's go term by term. We have three different terms. The antiderivative of 4 sine of x, that's going to be the antiderivative of sine of x is negative cosine x. So either use the memorize the stuff on the table or think backwards. Derivative of cosine is negative sine, so the derivative of negative cosine is positive sine. Next term, we have that reverse power rule. We're going to add 1 to the exponent, divide by that new exponent. Next one, we're going to have reverse power rule again. We're going to add 1 to the exponent. So adding 1 to negative 1 half is going to be negative 1 half plus 2 over 2, which gives us positive 1 half. Divide by that new exponent. And let's go ahead and just clean this up a little bit. And don't forget your plus c. The Forgetting the plus c is the most common mistake for these. So we have g of x is going to be negative 4 cosine x. I like to write, like for the second term, I'll do 2 fifths times x to the fifth. I just think, think it looks a little bit better like that. Dividing by 1 half is the same as multiplying by 2 and then plus c, and we are done. And of course, we can write that x to the 1 half using the square root symbol instead. So this next example is just a little bit more difficult. So find f if f prime is equal to e to the x plus 20 times 1 plus x squared to the negative 1, and f of 0 equals negative 2. So it starts off the same, right? We're finding the antiderivative of a function. This time we're given this little ordered pair, 0, comma, negative 2. The whole point of this is we're going to use this to find c. So anytime you have a question like this, it, it doesn't say find the most general antiderivative because we're not going to have a general antiderivative. We're going to use this ordered pair after we find the general antiderivative, and that's going to help us find what that plus c is. We're going to find that arbitrary constant. So first, let's go ahead and find the general antiderivative, which is going to be the similar notation as to uh, what we just had. Let's go ahead and maybe rewrite this though. So as usual, it might help to rewrite something. So we have e to the x plus, I'm going to rewrite the second term. 1 plus x squared to the negative 1 is the same thing as saying 1 plus x squared is just in the denominator. 
So this one is a little bit easier than it actually looks. Taking or finding the antiderivative term by term, the antiderivative of e to the x is itself. And if you really wanted to, you could rewrite this as 20 times 1 plus 1 over x squared. If you look at the anti-differentiation table from several pages ago, you'll see that the antiderivative of 1 plus 1 over x squared is tangent inverse of x. So that's one that you just have to know or else you would not be able to get that one. And then we have plus c. And also notice that the 20, it's a constant, it just comes along for the ride. And just a little bit of a reminder here, inverses are not the same as reciprocals, so tangent inverse does not equal 1 over tangent of x. Does not equal. No, no, no. So now what we're going to do is we are going to use f of 0 equals negative 2 to find c. And then when we find c, we're going to plug it back in here, and the whole thing will be our antiderivative answer. So f of 0 equals negative 2. That means it's going to be plugging in a 0 into x and setting the whole thing equal to negative 2. So this would be f of 0, which becomes negative 2. And it's e to the 0 plus 20 tan inverse of 0 plus c. Now we're going to solve this for c. e to the 0 equals 1. Anything to the 0 other than 0 equals 1. Plus 20 tangent inverse of 0. You have to remember that that actually equals 0. plus c. And now, obviously, this term cancels off to 0 here. So all we have to do is subtract 1. So we get negative 2 minus 1 equals c. We get c equals negative 3. So once we have that, we go ahead and plop that back into here. And we get our whole answer as the antiderivative is f of x equals e to the x plus 20 times tan inverse of x minus 3. Okay, let's do another example. We want to find f if f double prime equals 12x squared plus 6x minus 4, and f of 0 equals 4, and f of 1 equals 1. So notice here we're starting with the second derivative, and we're trying to get back to the function. So we should expect to have to take two antiderivatives. And similar to before, we have these ordered pairs, which we're going to use to help us find our constants. Okay, let's go ahead and first find f prime of x. And we have to find f prime of x first because f prime is the antiderivative of f double prime. So just working backwards here. So these are going to be reverse power rule. So it's going to be 12x add 1 to the exponent, divide by that new exponent. And 6x, we need to add 1 to the exponent, divide by that new exponent. We have a constant, so we just multiply an x on it, and then add an arbitrary constant c. So let's go ahead and clean this up. We get f prime of x, 12 over 3, we get 4x cubed, 6 over 2, 3x squared minus 4x plus c. So notice that we cannot solve for this yet, right? Because both of these ordered pairs that we're given are for the function itself, not the first derivative function. So now what we're going to do is we can find the function f of x by taking the antiderivative of f prime. So now taking the antiderivative of this right here, that will give us f, let me move it up a little bit, that'll give us f of x. And it's going to be reverse power rule again, right? It's going to be add 1 to the exponent, divide by that exponent, add 1 to the exponent, divide by the exponent, add 1, divide by it. So hopefully those ones are pretty simple. 
Now we need the antiderivative of c. Remember that c is a constant. The antiderivative of a constant is just multiplying an x onto it. And we still need a generic arbitrary constant for this whole thing. So instead of using c again, we're going to just use d. If you want to, you could use c1 and then make it c2 instead, but let's just use a d. Okay, so now we have the general function f of x here with two constants, c and d. Now we're going to use these ordered pairs to help us. f of 0 equals 4 and f of 1 equals 1. So using f of 0 equals 4, let's plug this stuff in and see what happens. We get 4 equals, now plug in a 0 everywhere. That's going to be 4 times 0 to the 4th over 4. And hopefully you can do this one in your head. Because if we're plugging in a 0 to all of these terms, you'll see that all of them actually cancel off, right? Except for d on the right. So we get d equals 4. So now let's go ahead and rewrite f of x. That's going to give us f of x equals, and I'm going to go ahead, I, we should have actually cleaned this up before we plugged it in. Um, so I'm going to clean it up now. So it's going to be 4's cancel, we're left with x to the 4th. Then the next term, the 3's cancel, we're left with x cubed. The next term, 4 over 2 is 2, plus cx plus 4, because d is now 4. And now the last thing we're going to do is use the other ordered pair that was given to us. And the other ordered pair was f of 1 equals 1. So we go ahead and plug that in. That's going to be 1 equals 1 to the 4th plus 1 cubed minus 2 times 1 squared plus c times 1 plus 4. And now you can see that we're going to actually end up solving this one for c. So we get 1 equals uh, 1 plus 1 minus 2, which is 0. So we're left with 4 plus c. Subtract 4 on both sides, we get c equals negative 3. And now we go ahead, plug that back into that c, and then we are all done. So f of x is going to be x to the fourth plus x cubed minus 2x squared minus 3x plus 4. So we found our function given our ordered pairs to help us find the constants. Okay, two more examples here. For this example, we're going to graph the function of f, of capital F, where lowercase f is given below. So we're given this function, and we need to graph the antiderivative of this function. So what we should do is we should think this is the derivative of a function, the graph of the derivative, and we need to graph the function itself. So we're also given that f of 0 equals 2. This is nice because this gives us a starting point. So I'm going to go ahead and start by just drawing the axes. And we are told that f of 0 equals 2. So that gives us the coordinate 0, 2. So that gives us a starting point. So since lowercase f is the derivative of capital F, which is what we're trying to draw here, that means the graph that we're given represents the slope of the graph that we're trying to draw. So the first thing that I'm going to do here is see where f, little f is negative and positive. Because if little f is negative, that means our function is decreasing. And if little f is positive, that means our function is increasing. So little f is negative on the interval... 0 to 1, and it's also negative from 3 to infinity. So negative, meaning the y values are negative, it's below the x-axis. 
and for where f is positive, it's positive on the intervals one, on the interval one to three. Okay, like I said, that being negative means our function is going to be decreasing over those intervals. And with that being positive, that means our function is going to be increasing over those intervals. Okay, some other things that we can recognize is right here and right here, where this curve, where the slope curve crosses the x-axis, that means the slope is zero. So what that means is that there's going to be horizontal tangents on our graph at those points. So I'm just going to label this as part one, maybe part two, and we can also deduce <clears throat> whether or not these are relative max, relative min, or neither at these points. Since it changes, let's take a look at x equals one, it changes from decreasing to increasing, where f is negative and then f is positive, so decreasing to increasing, that means there is a relative minimum at that point. And I'm just going to draw that with increasing and then decreasing arrows. And similarly, we can say that there's a relative max at x equals 3. Because if we look at the graph of the derivative, it changes from positive to negative, which means increasing then decreasing. Which once again, I'm just going to draw arrows. And the next thing is a little tricky. Let's take a look at what happens at x equals 2. At x equals 2, the derivative function has a horizontal tangent. And looks like it does at x equals 4 as well. So if there is a horizontal tangent on the derivative, that means the second derivative would equal 0. And if the second derivative equals 0, that means there is a possible inflection point. And we know that there are actually inflection points here because the derivative function changes from increasing to decreasing or decreasing to increasing. So notation is a little confusing. So instead of writing f prime, it's just going to be little f because that's what the derivative is written as here. Okay, so let's go ahead and put all of this together. So it's going to start at 0, 2, which we have on our graph, and then it's going to be decreasing from 0 to 1. So it's going to be decreasing. And then we know that there is a relative min at x equals 1. And then it's going to be increasing from 1 to 3 with a relative max at 3. And we also know that it changes concavity at x equals 2. So it changes concavity. And then we have a relative max right here. So you can see it's concave up and then concave down. And then it starts decreasing again from 3 to infinity with another inflection point at x equals 4. So it's going to be decreasing and then another inflection point. So there's an inflection point. We can see it's concave down, and then it changes the concave up. And that is our graph of capital F of x. Okay, so don't let the notation confuse you. You can think of this as like your original function, and then this function is the derivative function. Okay, one more example here. A ball is thrown upward with a speed of 48 feet per second from the edge of a cliff, 432 feet above the ground. Find its height above the ground t seconds later. When does it reach its maximum height, and when does it hit the ground? So something we have to know here is that acceleration due to gravity is 32 feet per second squared. And let's choose the upward direction to be positive. If we throw a ball upwards, the velocity is going to decrease, right? Because it's going to go up, and then it will come back down. So if the velocity is decreasing, that means acceleration would have to be negative. 
That is because acceleration is the derivative of velocity. So decreasing velocity, negative acceleration. Okay, so what we have is an acceleration function right now. And you can see that we're trying to find maximum height and when it reaches the maximum height and when it hits the ground. So we're going to need to take some antiderivatives here. What we need to remember is that a of t, the acceleration function, equals the derivative of velocity. So we need to find the antiderivative of acceleration to get back to acceleration, to get back to velocity. So taking the antiderivative, that will give us velocity. And the antiderivative of negative 32, with t as our variable, is just going to be negative 32 times t plus c. Okay, next piece of information, so a little bit tricky. We have this speed right here, right? Uh, speed of an initial speed of 48 feet per second. If we have an initial speed, initial speed means when time is zero. That's another way of saying v of zero equals 48. So what we're going to do is use v of zero equals 48 to find that constant c. So similar stuff to what we were doing before. So it's going to be 48 equals negative 32 times 0 plus c, which gives us c equals 48. So we go ahead, we plug that back in the equation. We get v of t equals negative 32t plus 48. And now we have the velocity equation, so we can find the velocity at any time t. And let's go back and look at the questions that are being asked. We're trying to find the height above the ground t seconds later. That just means we're trying to find the position function. And we're trying to find when it reaches its maximum height. So maximum height, if we throw a ball from a cliff, if we're looking on, it might look something like this. This would be the maximum height, right? The maximum height is going to be velocity is decreasing as it's getting higher and higher. Then velocity hits zero. And then velocity starts to get more and more negative because we chose upward to be the positive direction. So it starts off 48 feet per second. Maybe it gets down to 16 feet per second. Then it gets to v equals zero. And then maybe it gets to v equals negative 16, v equals negative 48, and so on. So that means to find that maximum height, we need to set velocity equal to zero, and we need to solve for t. So that's negative 32t plus 48 equals zero. So add 32t to both sides, divide both sides by 32. That will give us t equals 1.5. So that means this ball reaches its max height after 1.5 seconds after being thrown. Okay, now let's go ahead and use the fact that v of t equals the derivative of position. So we can find the position function, which is going to represent height, find the position function by taking the antiderivative of velocity. So the antiderivative of velocity is going to give us s of t. And it's going to be add 1 to the exponent, divide by that exponent. 48 is a constant, so multiply it by the variable. And we're going to have another constant, arbitrary constant, which we'll call d because we already used c. Okay, let's go ahead and just simplify that. Negative 16t squared plus 48t plus d. And we need to find d, right? So let's see what's given to us in the question. We are told that we're throwing this from the edge of a cliff. So that's our starting point. 
when time is zero, the ball's height is 432 feet. So once again, that's just a sneaky way of saying S of zero equals 432. And we're going to use that to find the constant. So we set it equal to 432. We plug in zero. And nice and easy, we get D equals 432. So to find the height, t seconds after we throw the ball. All we have to do is plug in, use this function and plug in for d. So the height is going to be s, which is negative 16 t squared plus 48 t plus 432. So this function will tell us the height t seconds after we throw the ball. And the last question here is when does the ball when does the ball hit the ground? Yeah, when does the ball hit the ground? So when the ball hits the ground, that means the height is zero feet above the ground. So what we have to do is actually set this function equal to zero and solve for t. So this is a quadratic. We could divide everything by negative 16. If we divide everything by negative 16, we end up getting t squared minus 3t minus 27, just to make it a little bit easier with the number smaller. And we'd have to use the quadratic formula here. And we would get t equals 3 plus or minus 3 radical 13 over 2. And we have to omit the negative answer, right? Because we throw the ball at t equals 0, our domain starts with 0. So that means we're only taking the positive answer, and this would give us, so 3 plus 3 radical 13 all over 2, this would give us about 6.9 seconds. Okay, so that is an application of anti, using antiderivatives um, with a physics type question. Okay, so that is it for this section.